I'm James Lewis, TV auctioneer and valuer. And this is a story which began three years ago, when I set out on an unexpected journey into a little-known period of Indian history. It all started with the auction of what I believe to be an insignificant painting. It was a sale which took me by complete surprise. I was commissioned to undertake a house sale, big Derbyshire estate, and lurking behind this very large cupboard, as we moved it out, were these Indian watercolours. They were paintings that caught the eye of Davinda Tour, one of the country's most prolific collectors of Sikh antiques. I was just blown away. I mean, I'd never seen a painting like this for sale. I'd only ever seen it in, in museums. 35, 45. I thought it might make a couple of thousand pounds, something like that. The bidding began and I had it at 500 and it went to six, seven. Five, six, but it soon started to gather momentum. 11,000 on the phone, 12,000 back in the marquee, and we had internet bidding from India as well. I mean, it was just crazy. The other chap I was competing against, he was wavering a bit from time to time. And it was this great fight, 13,000, 14,000, 15,000, eventually 20,000 pounds. It's yours. He looked over and said to me, he said, sold. He said, sold to a man who clearly knows a bit more about this painting than I do. I mean, it was a huge price for a very small watercolour. And everybody in the room had a good old laugh and a good old clap. It was something that I wasn't expecting and something that made me think, why? It's not the sort of thing that happens every day. Ever since that auction, I've been intrigued to learn more about the painting and the history behind it. It's a fascinating tale of a lost empire, a Sikh kingdom which had at its heart one of the greatest treasure collections the world has ever seen. And in this film, I'm going to track down these forgotten wonders, from secret vaults wow. to some of the greatest museum collections in the world. It's one of the most famous objects in the Victoria and Albert Museum. In the week when nearly 24 million Sikhs celebrate the birth of their founder, Guru Nanak, I'll discover that not only are they objects of great value, but works of art, which have the traditions and beliefs of the Sikh faith woven into the very fabric of their design. It's here in the British Library that my journey begins with a fascinating but little-known document dating from the 19th century. What we have here is the original handwritten inventory made by the secretary of the British Governor General of India in 1849, Dr. Logan. And what it lists is truly breathtaking. There's jewellery set with priceless stones, handcrafted weapons, and even what was believed to be the largest diamond in the world. I've been an auctioneer for over 20 years, cataloguing and valuing some amazing objects, but nothing compares to this. It is quite extraordinary. This incredible list gives us a glimpse into one of the greatest treasure collections in history. It was made at a time when the British had just conquered the Punjab in northern India. And Dr. Logan's task was to catalogue for sale every item in the personal treasury of the man who'd once been its ruler. His name was Maharaja Ranjit Singh, and he was one of the most charismatic and successful leaders in Sikh history and creator of the greatest kingdom they'd ever known. His collection of treasures was not only vast, but so valuable that the money generated by its sale had an impact on the future fortunes of the entire British Empire.
These enigmatic treasures are now scattered across Britain. And I want to see them for myself, so I'm starting by heading to a secret location to meet the collector who bought the intriguing painting in that Derbyshire sale. This is where I keep part of my collection. I've been collecting for about 18 years now and I started off collecting just arms and armour but I collect everything related to the Sikhs and the Punjab. Davinda is a British Sikh who passionately collects incredible objects, all from a very particular time in Sikh history. I love beautiful things, I love beautiful objects and, and those objects that contain some history. For me it's, it's just like time travel, it's the nearest that I can get to visiting uh, uh, 19th century Punjab, so it's a bit like my little time capsule. How are you doing? Hello there. How are you doing? Hi. Nice to see mm, you. Nice to meet Hi. you. Welcome. Thank you. My goodness. Gosh, I don't know where to look. <laughs> well, um, I think I might know where to begin. Yeah, go, go. Um, I've got a feeling you might like to see this first. You recognise it? <laughs> I, th I thought you might. Oh, how lovely. Gosh, you fought so hard for that. I did, I did. Um, yeah, there was tough competition. There was. Um, but, but here it is, so I'm, I'm very glad indeed. You, would you like me to tell you a bit more yeah, about it? Yeah, please do. Well, see, this is a, uh, a mid, middle of the 19th century watercolour and would have been painted by a local Punjabi artist but commissioned by the British. Just after the British take Punjab in 1849, and in this painting, we see this group of Sikh warriors called the Akali, the, the Immortals, um, on their way, travelling uh, with all of their belongings. They've got these repairs on the scabbards of their swords, this emaciated horse, emaciated horse and, yes. and this leader who's got gold quits on his turban. And now all he has left is this pathetic twig for a, for a switch. Um, and they go down to the south of India to safeguard the traditions because they know that they're going to be lost if they stay in Punjab. They look defeated, don't they? That's right. The artist has really got the atmosphere Absolutely. of what's happening. Absolutely. Tavinda's painting marks the end of a golden era in Sikh history. But he has another that reveals the beginning. It's the single most valuable item he owns. And it goes back to a period 10 years before the poignant image of the fleeing Akali, to an age in which the Sikhs were at the height of their political and military power. A time when the court of Ranjit Singh was the most splendid in the whole of India. So James, this is one of my prized possessions. The quality of that work is absolutely fantastic. So did you have to fight as hard for that one as you did for mine? A uh, little bit harder, in fact. Really? Yeah, no, it cost me, cost me six figures in the end. Oh, golly. It's a painting of Ranjit Singh uh, in his darbar, in his court. Um, the setting is the Lahore fort. Um, Lahore, northwest India, now, yeah. now in Pakistan, previously the capital of, of Punjab. And you can get a lot of information out of this picture. So you've got this wonderful in architectural information, the, inlaid marble stone. Okay. You also have all of Ranjit Singh's courtiers here assembled in, in rank order. Each of them with their wonderful Kashmir shawls and turban ornaments and feathers in their turbans. So what kind of man w w was Ranjit Singh? If we go back to the 18th century when young Ranjit Singh was a young boy, he became the head of his clan. And there were 12 clans, of 12 Sikh clans that ruled Punjab. And his clan was actually one of the smallest. Okay. His father died when he was very young and he became the leader. He led his army into battle at the age of 12. Did he? And by the age of 19, he'd, he'd managed to consolidate uh, the Punjab, overwhelming the other clan leaders through, okay. through both conquest and through a marriage of alliance. Maharaja Ranjit Singh was the founder of a Sikh kingdom stretching from Afghanistan to China, which he ruled for three decades. And through his astute leadership, he completely transformed the fortunes of the Sikhs. 
So Ranjit Singh becomes the Maharaja of the entire Punjab. Now, does his wealth come from internal sources or externally? There's some internal wealth in the sense that he is a clan leader, but predominantly it would come through conquest. In addition to that, we also have Ranjit Singh as this great patron of the arts. For example, we see Ranjit Singh here seated in the centre of this picture, yeah. sitting on his golden throne. Yes. He commissioned that after conquering Multan, which is a region now in Pakistan, and that was made by a local Multani artist. The golden throne of Ranjit Singh wasn't just a piece of furniture. It was his ceremonial seat of state. And unlike many of his other treasures, it wasn't auctioned off to raise money for the British. Instead, it was shipped back to England in 1853, and it survives to this day at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Fantastic, isn't it? It is. It is. It's one of one of the most famous and greatest treasures in the V&A. It was made for Ranjit Singh, probably made in Lahore, and it's, it just says everything about the power of the man, of the, of the empire, the importance of, of yeah. the Punjab at that time. It's very small, isn't it? It's very small, yes, but it's got tremendous presence, even though it's not a, a huge object. But he was actually rather, rather a small man. And when visitors came from abroad and met him, they, without exception, were disappointed because they thought he looked like a, a little old mouse <laughs> and was usually very, very plainly dressed. So to have something so opulent... It's certainly splendor, there yeah. to send a message to visitors, isn't it? It is, yes. But this throne wasn't just a status symbol. Ranjit Singh's choice of designer was a statement of the Sikh ideals which lay at the heart of his kingdom. It's recorded that it was made by a Muslim craftsman okay. called Hafiz Muhammad Multani. And the fact that he was a Muslim just underlines the hybrid nature of the, of the empire. And the Sikh, it was a Sikh empire, but Sikhs were actually in a minority. So the, Ranjit Singh was ruling an empire where Hindus were in a majority and there were more Muslims than Sikhs. And they were all equally able to rise to the top within the court hierarchy on merit. And that reflects almost certainly the teachings of the founder of Sikhism. Guru Nanak said, there is no Hindu, there is no Muslim, meaning that everybody in religious terms was absolutely equal. The Golden Throne demonstrated Ranjit Singh's skill as a leader whose Sikh principles forged religious unity. And it was also a work of such opulence that it could only have been created by a man for whom money was no object. Ranjit Singh was clearly a prolific patron of the arts, but that wasn't the only way in which he showed his wealth and his power. Amongst the treasures listed in Logan's inventories, one category in particular stands out. Weaponry. It's not something usually associated with religion, but for the Sikhs, military prowess has always been at the heart of their faith. I've travelled to the Royal Armouries in Leeds to find out more. Their keeper of armour is Tom Richardson, and he's taking me to one of the parts of the museum hidden from the public gaze, the weapon store, a vast room packed with arms from every age. Oh, my goodness. So, welcome to one of the treasure houses of arms and armour in, in the United Kingdom. It's one of our study collections. And we've got some of the pieces out here that actually come from the treasury of Ranjit Singh in Lahore. And because we can trace some of those pieces back to that 19th century provenance, 
we can actually now say that this matchlock musket, rather than just being an Indian matchlock musket, actually, we think, belonged to Ranjit Singh. Really? And what goes with this matchlock gun, also out of the treasury, is the belt with powder flask, pouches for bullets, all covered in velvet and in beautifully embroidered. I've seen very poor examples coming up for sale occasionally in, in the auction rooms. But that is just fantastic. It is. It's a, and not only is it fantastic as a work of art, if you like, but we can identify this as Ranjit Singh's own one, as well as being a beautiful example of the type. These incredible objects reflect the might and prestige of a Maharaja whose military prowess was legendary. And there was a reason why his forces were so successful. At the heart of his army were the fearsome Akalis, highly trained warrior Sikhs who for hundreds of years had defended the Sikh people against their enemies. The militarism of the Sikhs really goes right back to the 17th century when uh, the Akalis uh, appear and objects like this show that ancient Sikh heritage. This is a quoit turban of the Akalis and the, the quoits, the discs on it aren't for decoration. These are deadly weapons. These are steel sharpened throwing quoits, chakram which are characteristic <laughs> weapon of the Punjab from at least the 16th century onwards. And of course, odd job, James Bond. I mean, I, I have to say, you know, that makes me look very silly, but it's the same principle, isn't it? The sharpened top, sh sharpened bowler hat. Absolutely the same thing, and one can't help feeling that Fleming may have been inspired <laughs> by something from the Punjab in his invention of odd job's bowler hat. So, you know, Not it's a nice. weapon system on a turban. Yeah. And it's amazing to think of these being worn by uh, soldiers who are fighting on a modern battlefield with flintlock muskets with artillery. It's <laughs> an incredible story of using the best of the ancient world and the best of the modern world that makes the Sikh state under Ranjit Singh what it became. It would have been a real vision, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it just? Gosh. Ranjit Singh's armies were renowned as formidable fighters. But there was another factor behind his military triumphs. Here at the Royal Chelsea Hospital in London, there's a remnant of a Sikh artillery force that was the envy even of the British. So, amongst this amazing collection of cannon here, we've got two that have particular relevance to Ranjit Singh, haven't we? That's right, yes. Uh, Ranjit Singh loved artillery um, and when he started off on his military career he had two or three which were inherited from his father and uh, uh, a few that he'd captured. But he saw the British, you know, just across the border and he knew he had to modernise his army um, fairly quickly. So from that modest collection he grew his arsenal to almost about 800 cannons. But Ranjit's power and military success wasn't to last. In 1839, the greatest Maharaja in Sikh history died. And without his charisma and force of personality, the incredible empire he'd so successfully built began to implode. So tell me, how did this cannon end up here? OK, well, after Ranjit Singh died, uh, there was a period of about seven years when there was a lot of turbulence, nobody really at Lahore to actually take over the state and run it in, in the same way that Ranjit Singh did. The army had become almost the kingmakers, if you like, uh, of Lahore. And the Lahore government, in an effort to get them away from Lahore, get them uh, away from involvement with the politics, decided to, uh, to essentially have a war with the British. Uh, okay. Really, just to occupy the army, huh. and uh, what a reason. The border. <laughs> well, the border was only 30, 40 miles away, and there's a little bit of saber rattling from the the British as well at that stage. So that resulted in two wars, and these are part of the the guns that were actually captured, the booty, if you like, that was captured during that time. In 1849, after four years of bloody battles that dominated the Punjab, 
the British were victorious. The Sikh kingdom Ranjit Singh had fought so hard to create was annexed, and Dr. Logan began his vast inventory of the Maharaja's treasures for sale to fund the British imperial machine. But amongst the riches Logan listed, there was one jewel that was never destined for the auction house. It was the legendary Kohinoor diamond. Believed to be the largest in the world, and now set into one of the most important of all the British crown jewels. So valuable was it that the then Governor General of India, Lord Dalhousie, gave it to Queen Victoria as a personal gift. Its fate, once in the hands of the British, summed up the attitude of the imperialists to those that they conquered. It also marked the end of the greatest Sikh kingdom of all time. On the 1st of May, 1851, Britain was in a state of feverish anticipation. The trains, roads and highways were full of people from all over the country with one destination in mind, Hyde Park, London. They were all heading for the opening of one of the greatest spectaculars the British had ever seen. It was known as the Great Exhibition, Opened by Queen Victoria and pioneered by her husband, Prince Albert, it was a showcase for the best of the British Empire. And the centerpiece of this extravaganza was the celebrated Kohinoor diamond, lent by Queen Victoria herself and the single most valuable of all the wonders to come from the treasury of Ranjit Singh. But rather, than being awed at the stone's great beauty, the reaction of the general public was one of disappointment. The problem was the Indian style of cut meant the jewel didn't glitter quite as brightly as expected. The press wrote that on viewing the stone, although the crowds were huge, their hearts were as crushed as their bonnets. Prince Albert took the criticism as a personal slight against his wife and so commissioned the diamond to be recut according to Western tastes into a shape which would guarantee sparkle. It was a decision that caused an outcry. In 1852, the diamond faced its fate. Stone cutters were brought over from Amsterdam and a steam engine set up in the Strand. But the cutting process proved to be anything but straightforward. The hardness of a facet of the diamond caused it to become so hot that it melted the pewter in which the stone was held, threatening the implosion of the diamond itself. It looked like disaster. The jewel did survive, but at a tragic cost. After 38 days and 8,000 pounds, 43% of this incredible stone was now nothing more than dust. Today, the Kohinoor can be found in the Tower of London. It's now set into the crown of Queen Alexandra. Worn by the Queen Mother and displayed on her coffin at her funeral. We asked royal permission to film the diamond, but sadly we were turned down due to its sanctity and ceremonial significance. Ironic, really, when you think Prince Albert almost destroyed it simply to make it more fashionable. But there is one jewel of Ranjit Singh's kingdom that managed to escape the imperial grasp. It's a treasure that survives intact to this day. Something that the British couldn't dismantle, something that the British couldn't take to a museum. And it's a treasure that lies at the heart of the Sikh faith even today. Ranjit Singh's renovation 
of the holiest Sikh Gurdwara in the world. Wow. Davinda has some of the earliest photos of the temple ever taken. These photographs were taken by an Italian photographer who's a naturalised Brit, Felice Beato, in the 1850s. I've sold photographs by him before, and they are just fantastic quality, aren't they? Yeah, the, these are amongst the, these are the second earliest photographs ever taken of the Golden Temple. So they really do show the temple at its peak, and and we can we understand from the, these images that in many ways that the temple is one of the sort of lasting legacies of Ranjit Singh, one of those mm. real treasures because Ranjit Singh showered patronage on the temple. He, he beautified that temple, um, covered it in gilt copper and gold. Just gives you an idea of how splendid it must have looked. So what was it like before he started his work? Prior to that, it would have just been a sort of sandstone or limestone structure, quite plain, dating okay. back to the original building underneath dates back to 1765. So just a very plain stone colour. That's right. The Golden Temple has been the focus of intense religious devotion as well as political conflict for the past four centuries. But it was during the reign of Ranjit Singh that this iconic building came to look as it does today. Of all this Maharaja's incredible objects, this temple remains his lasting legacy. My journey to find the treasures of this dazzling Sikh kingdom is almost at an end. But I've still got one last question for Devinda. Why are you prepared to spend so much time, so much effort and so much money in this passion of yours for collecting? I'm on a voyage of self-discovery, really. Uh, I'm a British Sikh, brought up in Britain, but I had this wonderful connection with my ancestral home in Punjab. Um, I want to learn about the, the old customs and traditions that, that essentially make me who I am. The, the objects, they, they tell me wonderful stories that let me learn about myself. And um, I will continue to collect as long as I can, and I consider myself a temporary custodian, really. Uh, I'm the vehicle by which these wonderful objects come together. And, Prior to me, they existed, and they will exist long after I've gone. They're, they're, they've got an intrinsic value, but they're invaluable in terms of... For your people. In, in, for our people, in terms of the information that they have. And that story desperately needs to be told, the Sikh story, um, because there's a real danger that it will just disappear, and no one will ever know. Well, I've got a strange feeling that as long as you keep collecting and keep finding these treasures, I don't think the story will die. Thanks. It's been an absolute pleasure. pleasure. No, thanks, I've learned so much. Thanks, Thank you. you. I can't really believe that the sale of a tiny watercolour three years ago would have taken me on such an amazing journey. I've been to some wonderful places, met some incredible people, but also seen some real treasures. But most of all, has left me with an admiration of Ranjit Singh's Sikh kingdom and all that it stood for. I do hope that Davinda and his passion for collecting will help those objects live on and tell the story to the next generation. At £65,000, so thank you sir.